like to thank the organizers for accepting my paper, although I can hardly be considered an uh, yes, early career researcher. Um, I'm enjoying the company of the future faces of Viking studies, we hope. Uh, today I want to challenge the long-held assumption that Scandinavian Viking art of a period of approximately 750 to 1100 necessarily should be equated with animal-style art. And I want to combat the perpetuation of this belief, which has been, I would say, vitrified uh, into a presumption that the Vikings only produced and were only concerned with animal art. And I brought this subject to a couple of other audiences, but I wanted to bring it to the EAA to get kind of a broader reaction um, as I get a little bit farther into this uh, project. The animal style is so ubiquitous in the Viking world that the Swedish art historian Leonard Carlson in 1983 proclaimed that, and I quote, in the North, animal art is almost the only and totally dominating art form, end quote. And in 1966, David Wilson had declared that, quote, animal art was the only art which really satisfied the Viking mind, end quote. So, uh, so where did these assumptions come from? The paradigm has its basis in the typological studies of the later 19th century. Uh, the study of Viking Age art and its predecessors has focused on meticulous stylistic analyses of objects decorated in the so-called animal styles, ranging from the migration period of the 5th and 6th centuries through the Vendel or migration, uh, Mer Merovingian period, and then extending on through the Viking Age uh, from uh, the late 8th century to as late as the 11th century. Part of what's been so important about animal ornamentation is that it forms the basis for a Montelian typological, chronological underpinning of the study of this aspect of material culture, which is possible because minor details of the animals changed rather rapidly. Thus, the animals can be used as the organizing principle for our understanding of the chronology of styles, especially in the absence of otherwise datable context. As long as the animal art could be considered the status quo, researchers were quite happy to consider the rather rare figural pieces as overwhelmingly important for the interpretation of mythology. The largest category of anthropomorphic figures from before and during the Viking Age are the guldgubber, or gold foil figures, which could be pressed as multiples and thus are quantitatively uh, constitute a very large number of the human motifs. But the images are very small and quite abstracted. The next largest quantity uh, are represented by human representations on clothing and objects of personal adornment, mostly brooches and pendants. And human images on monumental stones, in particular the Gotlandic picture stones and also um, some of the Swedish rune stones in particular, uh, are fewer in number but are very significant in size uh, and narrative potential. And one-of-a-kind plastic three-dimensional sculpture, sculptures of human are quite rare. And finally, textiles and wooden transport conveyances, that is, the Yosemite ship and cart, uh, though rarely preserved, though wood is rarely preserved, um, also show some important human imagery. It's been common, although problematic, to label certain of these humanoid figures as based on Old Norse mythological beings described in 13th century and later Icelandic sources, uh, which were written by Christians. Although there is continuity in the use of the animal styles from the 5th through the 11th centuries, neither the styles nor the myths that might have been referenced remain static for this long period of time. So any identifications of specific deities have to be considered very cautiously. And I do concur with Michaela Hembrecht um, that only a few mo motifs can be plausibly identified with narratives preserved in medieval <clears throat> motifs. And Thor fishing, uh, which we see here on the left side, um, is one such identifiable motif that's recognizable from a narrative uh, and is seen here on a runestone in Sweden. On the other hand, I don't believe that some of the images, um, particularly on um, textiles, uh, as well as some of the scenes on Gotlandic picture stones uh, have been successfully uh, explained. Uh, perhaps we simply cannot explain that because we may lack uh, pertinent extant texts. Uh, more common than the few narrative scenes uh, that can be identified are simple human figures with or without 
distinguish, uh, distinguishable attributes. For instance, these depictions of women holding drinking horns or holding shields, uh, and they've been identified as Valkyries or shield maidens for so long that we just call them all Valkyries by convention, whether we're completely convinced that they all should be that or not. Um, and in particular, I just want to um, uh, remind us that, um, dare I say this after what we just said, uh, you know, we have a real woman who was buried at Birka uh, with a shield and, well, with, uh, excuse me, sword. And uh, is she a female white Viking warrior or not? I know the latest uh, questioning. Um, but we do at least have women with these objects, not just a mythical being. So uh, back to the figures. Uh, so although there is continuity uh, in the use of animal styles, through this long period, um, I do agree uh, with Karn Hoyle Nielsen as well that neither the styles nor the myths that might have been referenced remain static through this long period of time. So these uh, identifications have to be considered very um, cautiously. Um, and furthermore, uh, Helmbrick also declares that the attributes of weapons and drinking horns, for instance, uh, are not suitable for identifying figures from myth and legend. And in addition, um, there, uh, just for example, there's still great agree disagreement about whether this uh, tiny figure, only 18 uh, millimeters, this cast silver seated figure from Lyra, can it be identified as Ovin on his throne with his ravens, Hugin and Munin, um, flanking him, or is it a seated woman with generic birds uh, for some other reason? Uh, now, these motifs of single figures with or sometimes without attributes, are even more difficult to identify um, than larger compositions. Uh, James, James Graham Campbell suggests that the small three-dimensional figurines may have served as gods of the pouch, or pocket gods, he uh, extrapolates, as referred to in Helfreda saga, and a few other places as well. Uh, and in that case, a man carried a small image of Thor with him. But we don't know what these portable gods looked like. Now, some of the image that we, images that we find may represent gods and heroes, but others may depict living, breathing, Viking aged men and women. And from three-dimensional um, figures, three-dimensional sculptural work, uh, we may learn something else about Viking age people than we do from images of abstract animal art. And some of the images, such as here, we see costume and hairstyles, uh, hair of women that we do recognize from burials. And uh, the billowing pantaloons uh, that we see here uh, on a very small figure from of okra, but it can be compared to images uh, from uh, large tapestries and a Gotlin picture stone. Uh, and it also can be compared with textile fragments uh, found at Hethabe. So whether some anthropomorphic uh, figures depicted contemporary Viking Age people or their conceptions of gods and goddesses in the form of human men and women, we have the opportunity to kind of take a peek at what people looked like in the 9th, 10th, and 11th centuries. In any case, though, the corpus of human figures that we have available to study is growing. Um, and it's being transformed uh, by the flood of metalwork found by detectorists including the many uh, objects with zoomorphic <laughs> ornamentation, but also some with figurative subjects, particularly three-dimensional cast figures and brooches. And for over a generation now, metal detecting, particularly in Denmark, also in Poland uh, and a few other places, and, and well, in England, uh, needless to say, has greatly increased our quantity of Viking Age artifacts, although the reporting and the publication of these finds is really inconsistent. Um, in, uh, I could say, Greater Denmark, uh, including uh, Skona, uh, as well as Hedeby and Schleswig, uh, urban settlement excavations making use of metal detectors at, do we want to call them central places or proto-towns or whatever we call them? For instance, Tisu, as seen here, and also uh, Lyra and Hedeby and uh, Ubokra and so on, are revealing numerous uh, workshop sites and examples of figurative art and small three-dimensional sculptural art has been discovered at such locations. Now, in contrast, 
Uh, many of the emblematic examples of the styles of zoomorphic art were discovered in burial contexts. For instance, the early styles of uh, Bendel and Broa, uh, and particularly from the top here, the classic Viking animal age, uh, the animal style phases of Oseberg, uh, Bora, Jelinge, and Mammon, uh, all from burials. So the early study of the Vikings focused on burials and sometimes hordes, and the primary ornamentation discovered on objects from these contexts was zoomorphic. So it may be possible some of the animal figures designated familial or other affiliations. Human figural art um, may have had different functions from, than animal style art. And the new finds from metal detecting and large scale settlement excavations are leading to new interpretations. And whether these newly found objects are stray finds or lost objects, or the detritus from settlements, they include a greater proportion of human figural art than the burials and hordes that were the focus of early investigations. And this is really becoming the focus of my current investigations, but I don't have the numbers to show you everything yet. So I ask, why are we finding more anthropomorphic art in non-burial contexts? And what does this mean about the use of this art? Now, Unfortunately, whereas animal-style art is uh, expedient for determining relative chronology of an isolated work of art, without context, it can be notoriously difficult to date an undecorated three-dimensional sculpture unless it's part of an object that can be dated by its form, such as a brooch, uh, and so on. Um, in uh, 2003, Torsten Capella published a short piece on hidden people in Germanic ornamental art from the migration period through the Viking Age. And many of the examples he cited are from the earlier periods, uh, but he also included the Viking Age headless man, uh, heads broken off on the horn disc um, from the River Thames, humans carved in wood on the Osprey cart, and the man being swallowed by a snake-like creature on the mammon horse collar. These examples do fit neatly into the schema of animal style art and can be used as a bridge for chronologically placing some anthropomorphic motifs in relation to the animal styles in which they are enveloped. With new finds, the over overall picture of Viking arts changed since Ole Klink Jensen and David Wilson wrote Viking art in 1966. Uh, in James Graham Campbell's new version of Viking art about a, uh, half a century later, in 2013, he included several of the new finds, but he still referred to these works as, and I quote, atypical ventures into representational art. Unquote. He maintains, uh, and again, quote, the main history of Viking art has to be written from a study of the decoration of ornamental metalwork. But I protest that we no longer can insist that it must focus only on the animal art. Um, the works of Bill Wilson and Grant Campbell and, and also Sigmund Fuglesong and others uh, continue uh, to form the topological, chronological backbone of Viking art, and rightly so. Uh, they and others built up a detailed typology which together with carbon-14 dating, dendrochronology, numismatic analysis, uh, has allowed this construction of a detailed chronology of Viking art. Yet, figurative art has emerged to be more than a minor afterthought among Vikings. The flood of new pieces found by metal detecting and on settlement excavations has brought a wider variety of art and another view of Viking visual culture to our attention. As more examples of this art come to light, we glimpse a view of Viking art and people that had previously been nearly unknown. So now we, I say that we really must regard figurative art as something other than an oddity, um, as something uh, going beyond the vitrified um, old uh, paradigm. So that's it. Thank you very much.